used to carry out this attack. Mr Speaker, this forensic investigation has now produced sufficient evidence for the Independent Director of Public Prosecutions to bring charges against two Russian nationals for the conspiracy to murder Sergei Skripal, the attempted murder of Sergei and Yulia Skripal and Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey, the use and possession of Novichok, and causing grievous bodily harm with intent to Yulia Skripal and Nick Bailey. This morning, the police have set out how the two Russian nationals travelled under the names of Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bushirov, names the police believe to be aliases. They arrived at Gatwick Airport at 3pm on Friday the 2nd of March, having flown from Moscow on flight SU-2588. They travelled by train to London, Victoria, then on to Waterloo, before going to the City Stay Hotel in Bow Road, East London. They stayed there on both Friday and Saturday evenings, and traces of Novichok were found in their hotel room. On Saturday the 3rd of March, they visited Salisbury, arriving at approximately 2.25pm and leaving less than two hours later at 4.10pm. The police are confident this was for reconnaissance of the Salisbury area. On Sunday the 4th of March, they made the same journey, travelling by underground from Bow to Waterloo Station at approximately 8.05am before continuing by train to Salisbury. The police have today released CCTV footage of the two men, which clearly places them in the immediate vicinity of the Skripal's house at 11.58 a.m., which the police say was moments before the attack. They left Salisbury and returned to Waterloo, arriving at approximately 4.45 p.m., and boarded the underground at approximately 6.30 p.m. to Heathrow, from where they returned to Moscow on flight SU-2585, departing at 10.30 p.m. Mr Speaker, this hard evidence has enabled the Independent Crown Prosecution Service to conclude they have a sufficient basis on which to bring charges against these two men for the attack in Salisbury. The same two men are now also the prime suspects in the case of Dawn Sturgis and Charlie Rowley too. There is no other line of inquiry beyond this. And the police today have formally linked the attack on the Skripals and the events in Amesbury, such that it now forms one investigation. There are good reasons for doing so. Our own analysis, together with yesterday's report from the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, has confirmed that the exact same chemical nerve agent was used in both cases. There is no evidence to suggest that Dawn and Charlie may have been deliberately targeted, but rather were victims of the reckless disposal of this agent. The police have today released further details of the small glass counterfeit perfume bottle and box discovered in Charlie Rowley's house, which was found to contain this nerve agent. And the manner in which the bottle was modified leaves no doubt it was a cover for smuggling the weapon into the country and for the delivery method for the attack against the Skripal's front door. <coughs> Mr Speaker, the police investigation into the poisoning of Dawn and Charlie is ongoing, and the police are today appealing for further information. But were these two suspects within our jurisdiction, there would be a clear basis in law for their arrest for murder. <coughs> Mr Speaker, we repeatedly asked Russia to account for what happened in Salisbury in March, and they have replied with obfuscation and lies. This is including trying to pass the blame for the attack onto terrorists, onto our international partners, and even onto the future mother-in-law of Yulia Skripa. They even claimed that I myself invented Novichok. Their attempts to hide the truth by pushing out a deluge of disinformation simply reinforces their culpability. As we made clear in March, only Russia had the technical means, operational experience and motive to carry out the attack. Novichok nerve agents were developed by the Soviet Union in the 1980s under a programme codenamed Foliant. Within the past decade, Russia has produced and stockpiled small quantities of these agents, long after it signed the Chemical Weapons Convention. And during the 2000s, Russia commenced a programme to test means of delivering nerve agents, including by application to door handles. 
we were right to say in March that the Russian state was responsible. And now we have identified the individuals involved, we can go even further. Mr Speaker, just as the police investigation has enabled the CPS to bring charges against the two suspects, so the security and intelligence agencies have carried out their own investigations into the organisation behind this attack. Based on this work, I can today tell the House that based on a body of intelligence, the Government has concluded that the two individuals named by the police and CPS are officers from the Russian Military Intelligence Service, also known as the GRU. The GRU is a highly disciplined organisation with a well-established chain of command. So this was not a rogue operation. It was almost certainly also approved outside the GRU at a senior level of the Russian state. Mr Speaker, the House will appreciate that I cannot go into details about the work of our security and intelligence agencies, but we will be briefing opposition leaders and others on Privy Council terms, and also giving further detail to the Intelligence and Security Committee. Let me turn to our response to this appalling attack and the further knowledge we now have about those responsible. First, with respect to the two individuals, as the Crown Prosecution Service and Police announced earlier today, we have obtained a European arrest warrant and will shortly issue an Interpol red notice. Of course, Russia has repeatedly refused to allow its nationals to stand trial overseas, citing a bar on extradition in its constitution. So as we found following the murder of Alexander Litvinenko, any formal extradition request in this case would be futile. But should either of these individuals ever again travel outside Russia, we will take every possible step to detain them, to extradite them and to bring them to face justice here in the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, this chemical weapons attack on our soil was part of a wider pattern of Russian behaviour that persistently seeks to undermine our security and that of our allies around the world. They fomented conflict in the Donbass, illegally annexed Crimea, repeatedly violated the national airspace of several European countries and mounted a sustained campaign of cyber espionage and election interference. They were behind a violent attempted coup in Montenegro and a Russian-made missile launched from territory held by Russian-backed separatists brought down MH17. We must step up our collective effort to protect ourselves in response to this threat and that is exactly what we have done since the attack in March both domestically and collectively with our allies. We have introduced a new power to detain people at the UK border to determine whether they are engaged in hostile state activity. We have introduced the Magnitsky Amendment to the Sanctions and Money Laundering Act in response to the violation of human rights, and we have radically stepped up our activity against illicit finance entering our country. We also expelled 23 Russian diplomats who had been identified as undeclared Russian intelligence officers fundamentally degrading Russian intelligence capability in the UK for years to come. And in collective solidarity and in recognition of the shared threat posed to our allies, 28 other countries, as well as NATO, joined us in expelling a total of over 150 Russian intelligence officers, the largest collective expulsion ever. Since then, the EU agreed a comprehensive package to tackle hybrid threats. The G7 agreed a rapid response mechanism to share intelligence on hostile state activity. NATO has substantially strengthened its collective deterrence, including through a new cyber operations centre. And the US has announced additional sanctions against Russia for the Salisbury attack. Mr Speaker, our allies acted in good faith, and the painstaking work of our police and intelligence agencies over the last six months further reinforces that they were right to do so. Together, we will continue to show that those who attempt to undermine the international rules-based system cannot act with impunity. We will continue to press for all of the measures agreed so far to be fully implemented, including the creation of a new EU chemical weapons sanction regime. But we will not stop there. We will also push for new EU sanctions regimes against those responsible for cyber attacks and gross human rights violations and for new listings under the existing regime against Russia. And we will work with our partners to empower the OPCW to attribute chemical weapons attacks to other states beyond Syria. Most significantly, Mr Speaker, 
What we have learned from today's announcement is the specific nature of the threat from the Russian GRU. We know that the GRU has played a key part in malign Russian activity in recent years. And today we have exposed their role behind the despicable chemical weapons attack on the streets of Salisbury. The actions of the GRU are a threat to all our allies and to all our citizens. And on the basis of what we have learnt in the Salisbury investigation and what we know about this organisation more broadly, we must now step up our collective efforts specifically against the GRU. We are increasing our understanding of what the GRU is doing in our countries, shining a light on their activities, exposing their methods and sharing them with our allies, just as we have done with Salisbury. And, Mr Speaker, while the House will appreciate that I cannot go into details, together with our allies, we will deploy the full range of tools from across our national security apparatus in order to counter the threat posed by the GRU. I have said before, and I say again now, that the UK has no quarrel with the Russian people. And we continue to hold out hope that we will one day, once again, enjoy a strong partnership with the government of this great nation. As a fellow permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, we will continue to engage Russia on topics of international peace and security. But we will also use these channels of communication to make clear there can be no place in any civilised international order for the kind of barbaric activity which we saw in Salisbury in March. Finally, Mr Speaker, let me pay tribute to the fortitude of the people of Salisbury, Amesbury and the surrounding areas who have faced such disruption to their daily lives over the past six months. Let me once again thank the outstanding efforts of the Emergency Services and National Health Service in responding to these incidents. And let me thank all those involved in the police and intelligence community for their tireless and painstaking work, which has led to today's announcement. Mr Speaker, back in March, Russia sought to sow doubt and uncertainty about the evidence we presented to this House, and some were minded to believe them. Today's announcement shows that we were right. We were right to act against the Russian state in the way we did, and we are right now to step up our efforts against the GRU. We will not tolerate such barbaric attacks against our country. And together with our allies, this government will continue to do whatever is necessary to keep our people safe. And I commend this statement to the House. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of her statement and for the security briefings that we've received. Our thoughts are today with the family of Dawn Sturgis and with Charlie Rowley, who's still recovering from his ordeal. And we're obviously very sad at the death of Dawn and send condolences to her partner and her family. And we send our best wishes too to Sergei and Yulia Skripal for a very full recovery. The use of military nerve agents on the streets of Britain is an outrage and beyond reckless. Six months after the attack, Salisbury and its people are still suffering the after effects of this attack. I found that when I visited the city earlier this summer. There was an eerie calm hanging over the city, and on a summer's evening, a large park cordoned off for security purposes so the police can continue their investigations created a very strange and very eerie atmosphere. And I think we should show some sympathy for the people of Salisbury and what they've gone through, and I know the Prime Minister has done that in her statement. I commend the police for their superhuman efforts in forensically trawling through hours and hours of information in helping to identify the suspects. Given today's announcement on the decision to charge two Russian citizens with responsibility for this appalling attack, what steps is the Prime Minister taking to secure cooperation from the Russian government in bringing them to trial? The OPCW's... This is a serious matter, Mr Speaker, and I think they should be brought to trial. The OPCW's findings, the OPCW's findings of the evidence that Novichok was used in Salisbury are a stark reminder that the international community must strengthen its resolve to take effective action against the possession, spread or use of chemical weapons in any circumstances. No government, no government anywhere can or should put itself above the international law. The Prime Minister previously outlined that the type of nerve agent used was identified as being manufactured in Russia. 
The use of this nerve agent is a clear violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention and therefore a breach of international law. Mr. Speaker, based on the OPCW findings, the Russian government must give a full account of how this nerve agent came to be used in the UK. Will the Prime Minister continue to pursue a formal request for evidence from the Russian government under Article 9, brackets 2? It is in the interest of the peace and security of all people and all countries that no government plays fast and loose with the international human rights rules-based system. Can the Prime Minister update the House on what contacts, if any, she's had with the Russian government more recently to hold it to account? Our response as a country must be guided by the rule of law, support for international agreements and respect for human rights even and perhaps especially when other countries don't respect those agreements. I'll say more on that in one moment. But I want to assure the Prime Minister and the House that we will back any further reasonable and effective actions, whether against Russia as a state or the GRU as an organisation. And I would encourage the Prime Minister to seek the widest possible European and international consensus for this to maximise its impact. Mr Speaker, in 2015, the United Nations set up the Organisation for Prevention of Chemical Weapons, a UN joint investigative mechanism, but due to no agreement in the UN Security Council, there is no international mechanism responsible for attributing chemical weapons attacks to any specific perpetrators. So, Mr Speaker, can the Prime Minister outline what efforts the UK has made at the UN Security Council to overcome this impasse so that the OPCW will be allowed to provide clarity and attribution to the violators of international chemical weapons law. While we all hope that our country will never suffer such attacks again, can the Prime Minister outline what lessons have been learned by police and health service staff and what training has been given to both police and health service staff in dealing with a nerve agent attack? This is no way a criticism. Indeed, it's a congratulations to them on the way that they performed after the attack in Salisbury. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, we utterly condemn the appalling attacks. We condemn, we condemn the police and security service, commend the police and security. We commend the police and security services for their diligence in investigating this appalling crime. And we will support any reasonable action to bring those responsible to justice and to take further action against Russia for its failure to cooperate with this investigation. Prime Minister. Can I first of all say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, as I said in my statement, that I am sure all members of this House uh, join uh, both of us in saying uh, to the people of Salisbury, they have been through, and the Amesbury and the surrounding area, they have been through terrible disruption in the recent months, and we commend the dignity and calm way in which they have approached this and in which they have dealt with this. The Right Honourable Gentleman asked me what we had done in relation to approaching the Russian government uh, on the uh, question of the, uh, bringing these two individuals to justice. Um, as I said in my statement, uh, we have issued, we're issuing a, uh, an Interpol red notice, we've issued a European arrest warrant, but as we saw in the case of Alexander Litvinenko, Russia does not uh, allow its citizens to be extradited to face justice in uh, other countries. And therefore, as I think the phrase I used in my statement was that uh, an attempt at extradition would be, uh, uh, extradition request would be futile. What we have done is repeatedly asked Russia to account for what happened in Salisbury in March, and what they have done is responded with obfuscation and lies. Uh, we want Russia to act as a responsible member of the international community. Uh, that means that it must account for the reckless and outrageous actions of the GRU, which is part of the Russian state. This is a decision that would have been taken at a level outside the GRU and at a high level in the uh, Russian state. They must rein in the activities of the GRU and they can, must recognise there can be no place in any civilised international order for the kind of barbaric activity which we saw in Salisbury in March. The Right Honourable Gentleman asks me about the OPCW and the United Nations Security Council. 
We have been working through the OPCW, and I'm pleased to say that we had an overwhelming vote on a proposal that we and others had put forward uh, earlier in the summer in relation to strengthening the OPCW's ability to attribute uh, the, um, uh, to those who are responsible for the use of, uh, of chemical weapons. There are further discussions to take place within the OPCW on that issue, but I hope that the whole international community, and I would hope some of those who previously were cautious about uh, accepting what we had said in March about the responsibility for this, will now see the clear responsibility that lies at the doors of Russia and will act uh, accordingly. And on the United Nations Security Council, and it is right that the United Nations Security Council has not been able to come together to agree uh, an arrangement for, the attrib for attribution on the use of chemical weapons. Why has that been? Russia vetoes any attempt to do that. So we will work through the OPCW. We will continue to give the very clear message that states cannot and people cannot use chemical weapons with impunity. We will, we will maintain and do all we can to reinforce the international rules-based order in relation to the use of chemical weapons. And I and this government, and I'm sure other members of this House, will be very clear about the culpability of the Russian state in the attack on Salisbury. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Boris Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Prime Minister for her statement. I think the whole House will have noted what I'm afraid was the somewhat weaselly language of the Leader of the Opposition in failing to condemn what is now, I think, incontrovertible in the eyes of all right-thinking people, the involvement of the Russian state at the highest level in the Salisbury poisonings. And will my right honourable friend confirm that we will be asking that these two individuals are produced for justice uh, by Russia? Uh, and uh, will she uh, be joining in stepping up our diplomatic activity, our countermeasures, our targeted sanctions, so that the whole community, international community, can show their repugnance at what Russia has done in a way that I'm afraid the right honourable gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, has signally failed to do today. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Can I say to my right honourable friend, can I thank him for the uh, comments that he made, and obviously he was Foreign Secretary when the attack took place, and worked, uh, as I did, with the international community in relation to the response from that uh, international community. Um, the CP I understand that, I mean, the CPS does not have a policy of requesting extradition from those states whose constitution bars that possibility of extradition. Uh, what we are clear about, and we've, that's why we've issued the notices that are available to us in the Interpol Red Notice and the uh, European Arrest Warrant, uh, that, as I said in my statement, if these two individuals step outside Russia, then we will take every step possible to ensure that they are detained and are brought to face justice here in the United Kingdom. And on the other points that my right honourable friend makes, uh, we will indeed be stepping up our activity across the broad range of our capabilities and, uh, and uh, uh, what is available to us across our national security apparatus to ensure that we are taking every effort to deal with uh, mal malign state activity and in particular, as I said in my statement, the activity of the GRU. Mr. William Blackford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we on these benches welcome the Prime Minister's statement and the news that we have now been able to identify the suspects following the Salisbury attack. The attack on Mr. Skripal and his daughter was an unlawful use of force by the Russian state on the streets of Salisbury. We now have the evidence that absolutely, unequivocally, confirms that case. And of course, whilst our thoughts are with the Skripals and their recovery, we ought to today remember the sad death of Don Sturgis and Charlie Rowley, who is recovering from the attacks that he suffered from. Mr Speaker, the news of the arrest warrants today will send a clear message that all of us here will not tolerate the behaviour from the Russians that took place in Salisbury. And whilst I agree with the remarks of the Prime Minister and the actions that are open to us and that if the two individuals ever leave Russia, that they face the threat of arrest. I think working with our international partners, we really ought to put the maximum pressure on Russia to turn these two individuals over. They must face trial here in the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. There must always be a robust response to the use of terror on our streets. Let me 
reassure the Prime Minister that the Scottish National Party is fully committed to working constructively with the Government to ensure that we do all we can to protect the public. I am sure that others will join me across the House in extending our gratitude to the members of the security services and the police who have worked to ensure that these announcements today have been made. The dedication and commitment to rooting out these criminals is absolutely critical to securing the safety of citizens here. And on behalf of the Scottish National Party, I send my sincerest thanks for all their efforts. Here, here. Mr Speaker, the threat from Russia must always be met by a united front from all of us together standing in solidarity against the abuse of power. Only together will we take on the abuse of state power by the Kremlin, and only then can we ensure that we work towards a peaceful future for citizens across the United Kingdom and beyond. It is right that the Prime Minister has brought to us this statement today, and I am grateful for that. I do look forward to justice being done. It must be done. I would like to ask the Prime Minister if she could also provide us with an update on the Government's actions to tackle Russia's abuse of Scottish Limited Partnerships. SLPs have been used to move more than $88 billion from Russia in just four years, according to our own Government. All action must be taken to stand up to this abuse of power and show that we are prepared to take Russia on for human rights abuses, for money laundering. We will and we must, together, take effective action. Yeah. 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 Can I first of all thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for the tone of his response and also thank him for the support that he has shown for the Government's yeah. work. Uh, he mentioned the emergency services and I, I again uh, repeat, as, as I said but as he has also said, um, our immense thanks <laughs> to all those in the emergency services, the police, our security and intelligence agencies and the National Health Service who have responded to, the, to, this, to, to these uh, uh, incidents that took place, to the work that the police and the intelligence agencies have been done that have enabled us to be in the position of identifying these two individuals and issuing the Interpol Red Notice and the European Arrest Warrant. Can I also recognise that in the clean-up that took place, the armed forces were also uh, present and their expertise was available, and we're grateful to them too. Um, he asked about the Scottish Limited Partnerships. The Home Office has been working with the Business Department in looking at this issue. It is the intention to bring legislation forward to cover a range of abuses, uh, and uh, I'm sure that the Security Minister would be happy to uh, speak to the Right Honourable Gentleman about that. Can I, can I also thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for his uh, understanding and acceptance of what I have said in my statement today about the role of the GRU and the culpability of the Russian state? Mm. Can I thank him for his clear condemnation yeah. of the Russian state? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Can I say I would only wish that that clear condemnation would be possible from the leaders of all parties exactly. in this House? Yeah. Yeah. Don't it grieve. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, my right honourable friend is absolutely right in her identification of the Russian state. Yeah. What we are at the moment is the victim of state terrorism yeah. uh, by a state which is in fact run as a gangster organisation yeah. 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 and which threatens us all and has done it repeatedly on the international stage and is wholly outside the international rules-based system. Yeah. And I greatly agree with her and commend the work of our uh, police and our security services in elucidating the surrounding circumstances around uh, this appalling act. I look forward on behalf of my committee, the Intelligence and Security Committee, to further details uh, uh, relating to the background. In the meantime, does my right honourable friend agree that we are going to have to look carefully at the ease with which Russian nationals on Russian passports can come in and out of this country? Obviously, as a free country, we wish to facilitate exchange of people, but it clearly is going to become a pertinent issue when it becomes so apparent that the system is being abused by the Russian state for the purpose of sending hoods and murderers to come into our country to kill our citizens and those who are protected by us. Yeah, yeah. 
Prime Minister. Uh, can I thank my right honourable friend for his comments? And, and uh, uh, we will indeed, as I said in my statement, be ensuring that further detail is available for the Intelligence and Security Committee. Uh, the individuals, as I understand it, came into the uh, United Kingdom under valid passports that were issued by the Russian government. Uh, I think we have already stepped up our powers through the introduction of the ability to be able to stop people at port to consider and, and investigate whether they are involved in hostile state activity. Of course, we on a continual basis look to ensure that we have all the powers necessary to, uh, to, deal, with, uh, to deal with these issues, and my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, will continue to do that. Sir Vincent Cable. Uh, can I give strong support to the Prime Minister for her condemnation of the Russian state? Uh, but since our seriousness will be judged by actions rather than words, can she explain how many of the Russian oligarchs, who we know to be cronies of the Russian regime and have wealth in the UK, have had their assets seized under unexplained wealth orders following the powerful example of the United States? Can I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman? Can I thank the right honourable gentleman for his opening uh, remarks on this issue, and for his reference to the role of the Russian state in this, uh, in what happened in Salisbury? Um, the National Crime Agency has stepped up its activity in relation to uh, illicit finance. Uh, they, a considerable amount of work is being undertaken in relation to that. Of course, these are matters that are operational matters for the National Crime Agency. We don't comment, as the uh, right honourable gentleman will know, on individual cases. But I can assure him that the work that is uh, going Going on in relation to these matters has been stepped up considerably since uh, what happened in March. Amber Rudd. Mr. Speaker, can I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the security services and the police services for their brilliant work in arriving at these conclusions? Two named Russian intelligence officers. Nothing could be more conclusive. It is the nature of the Russian propaganda machine that they will always try and throw smoke up to confuse us. But does she share my hope? that the clear evidence here will make it clear to all people who doubted what we said before, and I think particularly of the opposition front bench, that when the security services lead us in the di this direction, they know what they are doing. Yeah. 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 Minister. Can I, can I say to my right honourable friend, first of all, can I thank her for the role that she played as Home Secretary and the visits that she made to Salisbury particularly on this, uh, on this issue. But she is absolutely right. Uh, there were those who, when I first presented uh, what had happened in uh, uh, Salisbury in March to this House, uh, questioned the uh, point that we had made, questioned the statement that I had made about the involvement of the, uh, of the Russian state. Now we have clearly seen the police have identified two individuals. Uh, the CPS, the independent CPS, has laid charges against those two individuals. Uh, we have clearly identified a link with the Russian military intelligence agency, the GRU. Uh, and it is clear that permission for uh, an act of this sort would have been taken outside the GRU and at a senior level within the Russian state. I think it is incumbent on all those who were sceptical back in March to recognise the evidence that has been laid before this House and before the public and recognise the involvement of the Russian state and condemn them wholeheartedly. Yvette Cooper. <clears throat> Can I thank the Prime Minister for her immensely serious statement and pay tribute to the impressive forensic work of our police and intelligence agencies. They and the government have support from across the House for their work in the face of this vile chemical attack yeah. in the face of this threat from the GRU and the, Russian op the operations of the Russian state, which we must unreservedly condemn, yeah. both for this chemical attack but also the wider propaganda and the online spread to undermine democracy and truth. But Alexander Litvinenko was murdered 12 years ago, and she will know there were then long delays in setting up an inquiry, in taking action against assets of suspects who were identified and those linked to them. Has she considered the lessons from the Litvinenko case, and what further measures is she ensuring take place now uh, around those suspects and those who may be linked to them so we learn those lessons too? Minister. Can I thank the, the Right Honourable Lady for her comments and for her support for uh, the police for the intelligence agencies and the work that the Government has, has been doing in relation to this, uh, this particular issue? Yes, we did, have, we did look at the Alexander Litvinenko case, uh, at the lessons that we 
we needed to learn as a government from the response to that and the action that was taken in that. I think we saw and, and we acted accordingly. I think one of the key differences, of course, that we saw in March from what happened in the Litvinenko case was the very strong international response to the, uh, what had happened here in Salisbury. Uh, as I say, the biggest single number of expulsions uh, uh, ever that has taken place of, of uh, Russian uh, personnel of this sort. Uh, but we will continue, obviously, to look at this, uh, at this matter. We will, be con we will be looking at the issues of uh, the further action that can be taken. As I said, we will be using all the tools in, in our national security apparatus in order to be able to do that. Um, it isn't, of course, possible for me to go into detail on some of those matters, um, but I'm sure it would be possible to give the Right Honourable Lady a briefing on Privy Council terms. Dr Julian Lewis. May I urge the Prime Minister to make more of the passage of a law in July 2006 by the Russian Federation Parliament specifically enabling and empowering its President to order the assassination of Russia's enemies abroad. As we know, this happened only weeks before the killing of Litvinenko. And if she really wants to send a strong message to the Russian government, will she have a quiet word with the Chancellor to enable defence to get the uplift in the defence budget that it needs yeah, yeah, yeah. if further cuts in our ability to deter Russia are not to be inflicted by the budget? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend that he is right, of course, to highlight the law that was passed in Russia in 2006 that does give that ability to order assassinations outside of the, uh, of the Russian state. Um, and he's right to, uh, to point that out. I think it's an important fact for people to recognise that is the background uh, against, which, uh, we, against which they are operating and we see uh, happening today. Um, can I also say to my honourable friend, and I suspect he won't be surprised at the response I'm giving him in relation to this matter, of course we are looking at modernising defence programme. As we look at the threat that is posed by Russia, at the threat that we see from a whole variety of, uh, of uh, other sources as well. What is important is that we look not just at the conventional way in which we have dealt with those threats, but we recognise the diverse and varied way in which malign state activity is undertaken today. As I referenced, for example, in my statement, we see a lot of propaganda and cyber activity taking place by the Russian state. We need uh, to make sure that we have all the tools at our disposal, and that will run across a number of parts of uh, government and not simply in the Ministry of Defence. Pat McFadden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The first duty of anyone occupying the office she holds is to protect the public and to be clear eyed about the threats that the country faces. Can I thank her for her statement today and echo the praise that she and other members have given to the police and intelligence services for the tremendous work that's been done in enabling her to come to the conclusions which she has shared yeah, yeah. with the House today? But given her responsibilities, can I ask her why she thinks the Russian state authorised such a barbaric operation on the streets of the UK, this state-sanctioned attempted murder? Well, can I thank the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for his opening comments and for his um, praise for the police and intelligence agencies. As I said, 250 de detectives trawling through 11,000 hours of CCTV, over 1,400 statements. This was a very significant investigation that has uh, taken place. And then, of course, has been the work of the intelligence agencies, which I referred to in my statement as well. Um, I think, I mean, uh, it is not for me to... Uh, describe what was the motivation behind the Russian state in relation to this issue. I suspect that they wanted to give a message uh, to those Russians uh, who uh, were living elsewhere, uh, who had been involved uh, in, the, uh, in matters relating to the Russian state, uh, and that is the only reason that I can assume that lay behind what they wanted to do. But it is up to the Russians to explain what happened in Salisbury. I have said consistently, I did it in March, I've said it again this afternoon, we've said it uh, since, that the Russian state needs to explain what happened in Salisbury. All we've had is obfuscation and lies. Sir Roger Gale. Mr Speaker, in the light of her statement, 
Would my right honourable friend agree that for the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe to change its rules at the behest of the Secretary General to facilitate the readmission of the delegation of the Russian Federation would make an absolute nonsense of the Convention on Human Rights? And would she agree that it is incumbent upon the Council of Europe and all other international bodies to send a clear message to the Russian Federation that human rights is not an a la carte menu? Well, well, can I thank my friend for the very uh, real issue that he raises? Can I say, of course, the government will be looking to raise this issue in international fora in which we are able to do so, but I think he is absolutely right. I would hope that this information uh, obviously will be provided to the Council of Europe, and I hope this will make them think again about the steps that they are proposing. Uh, and as my honourable friend says, human rights are not an a la carte menu from which you can pick and choose. Roshanara Ali. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I also commend the police and security services for all their work on this very serious uh, issue? This morning, my colleague, um, the Honourable Member for Popper and Limehouse, and I were assured that uh, local people don't face a threat, and the local hotel um, in Bow, uh, where the um, perpetrators stayed, uh, has been checked. But can I, ca and, and that, that they are safe, but can I ask the Prime Minister to assure us that? further reassurance will be provided uh, and that lessons will be learned and that local police who have to work in partnership with the security and counter-terrorism officers must be supported in, in dealing with this new kind of threat that cuts across different boroughs in different parts of the country. Well, can, I, can I say to the Honourable Lady, um, obviously she raises an issue uh, that is an important one, and it's right that we're able to give that reassurance. Um, in relation to the uh, hotel that uh, the individuals stayed in. Um, it is very clear the, the Chief Medical Officer has also given a statement this morning about the issues relating to, uh, to public health and has made very clear uh, about in that statement about the uh, low risk that, uh, that pertains there. The, um, as regards the hotel, samples were taken from the room as a precautionary measure. Uh, and. Uh, that was uh, first happened. The contamination at the Novichok was identified at uh, the initial stage when that hotel room was identified as being below that which would concer cause concern for public health. And uh, then further examples have uh, further samples have been taken and have come back negative. Uh, and following these tests, the experts deemed that the room was safe and it posed no risk to the public. I believe the chief medical officer has indicated that anybody who stayed in the room between the 4th of March and the 4th of May, who, uh, had they been affected, would have been affected by now. No, there have been no reports of any uh, health effect on anybody uh, during, that, uh, during that period. But reference has made people may wish to get in touch with the investigatory team to, uh, to be reassured on this matter. But also, she mentioned other elements. They are very clear. The chief medical officer has made clear that staff who operated, maintained and cleaned the transport systems are safe. There is no risk to members of the public who travelled alongside the individuals between the 2nd of March and the 4th of March or on those who used the transport system afterwards. Bob Seeley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, our right honourable friend has mentioned the 2006 Russian law, which would surely logically assume that the man who, who allowed this assassination attempt to happen was the head of the Russian state, Vladimir Putin. But the GRU is not a, a new organisation, and has the Prime Minister, is the Prime Minister aware of the GRU's involvement as the lead agency in the Crimean annexation, as a critical agency, but not the only one in the East Ukrainian war? Uh, the um, GRU General Orion, who was the senior man at the time in the shooting down of the MH17, and the very close and short command chain, which is allegedly exists between the GRU and the Russian presidency. Thank you. Prime Minister. Can I, can I say to uh, my honourable friend, and I know that he has himself personally worked tirelessly in uh, ensuring that the activities of the Russian state, we are all aware of the activities of the Russian state and the threat that they, uh, that they pose. Um, obviously, we have specifically identified the, uh, uh, the two individuals in relation to the GRU. As I have said, the GRU has had, as he has acknowledged, involvement elsewhere. There are other parts of the Russian state that has hold, had involvement in malign state activity uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, and as I said in my statement, um, it uh, so it is almost certain that decision, a decision of this sort would have been taken outside the, uh, the GRU and at a senior level. Mike Gates. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, the Prime Minister referred 
in her comprehensive and detailed statement to cooperation with our European Union partners and the European Union chemical weapons sanction regime. Can she assure me and the whole country that we will continue to work closely with our European Union partners as the closest possible security and intelligence and sanctions cooperation will be necessary whatever happens in March next year. Can, can I give the Honourable Member that assure, reassurance? Um, we recognise the importance of working with our European partners on these matters of security. It's why in the proposals for our future relationship we have set a, 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 a proposals out for uh, an ambitious and a comprehensive security partnership uh, which covers cooperating, cooperating together across a range of areas, um, continued access for the UK to certain instruments that can be helpful in um, uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, these matters such as the European arrest warrant. And indeed, in another area where we have taken our own powers such that after March next year we'll be able to have our own individual sanctions uh, regime, we would want to continue to cooperate with uh, our European partners as well on those issues too. Mark Francois. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The GRU is Russian military intelligence. Its operatives are recruited almost exclusively from the Russian military. It reports to the Russian general staff via then to the Defence Ministry and on a very short leash to the Kremlin. So we should understand the enormity of what has happened here. Absolutely. British citizens have been murdered, or almost murdered, on British soil by two highly trained Russian soldiers. Absolutely. Can I suggest that in responding to this heinous attack, we should now target the GRU both in our country and again among our allies and seek specific expulsions of GRU officers from around NATO and our friends around the world in order to disrupt the networks of this vile organisation. Yeah. Well, can, can I say to my honourable friend that he makes a very important, uh, a very important point? I think it is important uh, that we do now specifically look at the actions of the GRU and take action in relation to the GRU. That is about uh, sharing our experience and our understanding of the GRU with our allies. Uh, this, is, this is about the threat that is potentially posed to other countries. It is not just about what happened here, heinous though that crime was, as my honourable friend has said. It is about ensuring a level of protection and security for everybody across Europe. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Global Witness have found that 43% of Scottish limited partnerships are controlled by persons with either a correspondence address or citizenship of a former Soviet state. However, there are still huge issues with compliance, and many SLPs have not even provided a person of significant control. Can I ask the Prime Minister for more detail on future legislation to combat dirty money laundered through SLPs, and whether resources and priority will be given to, be, to enforcing existing laws through Companies House, which remains a huge loophole in all of this? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady, as I replied, responded to her leader uh, here, the Right Honourable Gentleman, in his uh, uh, response to his statement this afternoon, um, the uh, Home Office and the Business Department have been working on this issue in relation to Scottish Limited Partnerships. They have been looking at some of these areas of abuse. We have, as a general point, stepped up our ability to deal with economic crime through the establishment within the National Crime Agency of the National Economic Crime Centre, uh, and we are continuing to build up that ability to deal with, uh, to deal with economic crime. Uh, as I said, I'm sure that the Security Minister will be happy to speak to the, uh, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman as leader of the SNP here about the action and the work that is being taken. There is an intention to legislate in this area. Obviously, we need to make sure that we're going to get this right. It, this SLP is not the only issue that has been raised in this area, and we need to look at a range of abuses. John Whittingdale. Uh, my right hand friend has set out very powerful evidence that a British citizen died on British soil as a direct result of a Russian assassination. But she will be aware there have been a number of other deaths in Britain in the last few years of Russian citizens or people with close connections with Russia. 
Can she say whether those cases are now being actively re-examined? Yeah. Can I, can I say to my right honourable friend that he's absolutely right to raise that issue? Uh, there have been a number of cases. I think the number of 13 or 14 comes into my head, but those have indeed been uh, reconsidered by the police. They have looked at all the evidence in relation to, to those matters. I understand uh, that a letter will be shortly going to the chairman of the Home Affairs Select Committee, uh, setting out the outcome of, uh, of that. Um, but I, I understand that there is no cause for um, further consideration of those cases. Ms. Bryan. I do not doubt for a single instant that the bloody trail goes all the way to the Kremlin and to President Putin himself personally. I don't think anybody acting for the GRU would. This, this is, is the, the primary audio, audio circuit, circuit for the Reuters, Reuters Live Service. service. This, this is, is the, the primary audio, audio circuit, circuit for the Reuters, Reuters Live Service. service. This, this is, is the, the primary audio, audio circuit, circuit for the Reuters, Reuters Live Service. service. This, this is, is the, the primary audio circuit, audio circuit for the Reuters, Reuters Live Service. service. This, this is, is the, the primary audio circuit, audio circuit for the Reuters, Reuters Live Service. service. This, this is, is the, the primary audio, audio circuit, circuit for the Reuters, Reuters Live Service. service. This, this is, is the, the primary audio circuit, audio circuit for the Reuters, Reuters Live Service. service. This, this is, is the, the primary audio 